Welcome to Nursing School Explained in this video on peripheral artery disease or that's sometimes also referred to as PAD for abbreviation. And the underlying cause is atherosclerosis. Just like anywhere in the body, the arteries can get clogged, causing that narrowing of the vasculature and then the blood flow is impeded. So if we look at this here, pathophysiology of PAD is atherosclerosis affecting the vessels of the lower extremities. Just like with atherosclerosis anywhere in the body, risk factors include smoking, which is a very big risk factor here, as well as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, diabetes, and often we see PAD, peripheral artery disease, also in patients with coronary artery disease and carotid artery disease because the plaque buildup doesn't just affect certain body parts, it affects the arteries of the entire body and then we can see that progressing to the lower extremities as things progress. So with PAD there is a term called intermittent claudication and think about this as intermittent being off and on and then claudication think about it as a, as a cloud kind of surrounds the patient's lower extremities. So as the patient exerts themselves or walks, as the blood flow is concentrated to the lower extremities, there is some ischemia that happens because of the narrowing of the arteries that blood flow is impeded. And so this uh, is considered a reproducible muscle pain due to that ischemia, that lack of blood flow to the lower extremities. And reproducible means that the patient walks, for example, for one mile and then after one mile he starts he or she starts having symptoms so that is reproducible with the same amount of exercise or time that the patient experiences these signs and symptoms and they typically resolve within less than 10 minutes of rest so as soon as the patient stops walking the blood flow is restored the body doesn't have to work so hard the blood flow um, is a little bit less demanding to the lower extremities as the muscles don't need that oxygen and therefore the symptoms resolve. And that is that term intermittent claudication. And these signs and symptoms that patients often report is a burning, heaviness, soreness or tightness in the lower extremities, particularly in the calves. They might also complain of paresthesia, so numbness and tingling. Think about if the blood flow is not correct or not happening the way that it should, it can also affect the nerves, therefore leading to this numbness and tingling. Their skin might look thin, shiny and taut and there might be some hair loss. Again, this is mostly happening over time. This is not a sign and symptom that will happen you know, overnight, but it will happen very slowly as that blood flow is impeded, the hair growth um, doesn't take priority. For, for the blood flow, the blood flow to the skin also doesn't take priority, therefore the skin becomes thin, shiny, and there it loses hair. And then with atherosclerosis, think about it, if there is not a considerable amount of blood flow or normal blood flow to the lower extremities, we're not going to be able to palpate their pulses, so they might be weak or absent completely. And then there are two other terms, which is elevation pallor and dependent ruber. So now when the patient, typically when the patient has lower extremity pain, we will tell them to elevate the lower extremities to kind of help with swelling. But in this case, if the blood flow is already impeded and we elevate that lower extremity, now the heart has to work extra hard, pumping through those lower extremities that are clogged and the patient will have lack of blood flow, which is that elevation pallor. So if the legs are elevated, there will be pallor or paleness to the lower extremity because it increases the obstruction. And then the dependent ruber means that if the patient sits down like on a chair and the, ele the lower extremities are in a dependent position, they will kind of turn this ruddy, reddish, blue kind of a color. And that is because there is some reactive hyperemia occurring. So increased amount of blood flow, specifically after the exercise, the body is trying to feed the lower extremities with some extra blood and therefore they kind of become engorged with that extra blood and they therefore look a little bit kind of like red um, in color, ruber. Think ruber, ruby, red. And then over here for uh, diagnostic tests. So when we want to know 
how severe is the obstruction of the arthrosclerosis in the lower extremities. We usually check that with a Doppler ultrasound where we can check the blood flow, but also we can measure the blood pressure in the lower extremities. And typically that's done at three different places. So in the thigh, right below the knee and right above the ankle. And if the blood pressure drops from one location to the other by more than 30 millimeters of mercury, that is diagnostic of PAD. Also, we can do a CT angiogram, inject contrast to see exactly how bad the obstruction is, where is it located, and maybe if the patient has already developed collateral circulation. And then another test here that is uh, very indicative of PAD is called the ankle brachial index or ABI. So we take the systolic blood pressure in the affected extremity, the ankle, and then in the brachial arteries of the upper arm. And the brachial artery is either left or right, whichever one is higher. So we take that ankle systolic blood pressure and divide it by the brachial systolic blood pressure. And then there's usually a graph or a sheet depending on the ratio that this comes out to be. It is either diagnostic or not diagnostic, or it also tells us more about the severity of the PAD. Complications. So as the lower extremity loses blood flow to the skin, um, to the hair, to the blood vessels, that skin and muscles, they atrophy. So not enough blood flow means less exercise capability, meaning atrophy. And then there can also be delayed wound, wound, delayed wound healing because we need that oxygen to be transported to the tissues in case there is a small abrasion, a blister, a cut. But if we can deliver the oxygen because of this narrowing of the arteries, um, the wound healing will be delayed. And if it is significant, then it can lead to necrosis. Um, think about that also many times patients have underlying um, hypercholesterolemia or diabetes. So now they have a blister, they already have delayed wound healing from their PAD. Now they have diabetes on top, maybe they have decreased sensation. So that pretty quickly can lead to significant wound problems and also necrosis. And then it also depends on the um, amount of collateral circulation that they've might developed. And if you want to know more about this term, I have a separate video going into that. Treatment for PED is decreasing the risk factors. If we know patients have hypertension, they're smokers, they have high cholesterol, they have kidney issues, they're diabetics, and also have these other atherosclerotic um, arteries, then we certainly need to counsel them on nutrition, weight management, decrease smoking, decrease your lipid intake, and also um, exercise regularly and manage their weight here. Many times patients are placed on antiplatelet agents such as aspirin or Plavix to, as with anybody with, with um, atherosclerosis, to make the blood a little bit more viscous going through the obstructed or narrowed arteries. We also want to focus on foot care and make sure they have properly fitting shoes so that they don't have any kind of wounds that they develop on their lower extremities that then might have trouble healing. Um, if all these, this fails and the patient has significant PAD as evidenced by any of these diagnostic tests or they are so symptomatic that they now are not able to ambulate at all, there are surgical options. So just like in the coronary arteries, stents can be placed to open up the clogged arteries. There can be peripheral artery bypasses that are placed. So we're bypassing the artery that's clogged. Or in severe cases, if necrosis occurs, uh, amputations might occur. As for nursing care, our job is always making sure we educate our patients about the disease, how it occurs, and to decrease their risk factors. In the post-op period, when any of these occur, we always want to focus on the five P's, just like with any lower extremity injury. So we want to focus on the circulation, the nerve, the, the movement of the lower extremities. We also manage their pain and check for complications because arteries have been involved, there can be a chance for bleeding, so hemorrhage, there can be a hematoma formation, 
They can also de develop a thrombosis, as with anybody post-op. They might develop Compartin syndrome or signs and symptoms of infection. So we need to be aware on how to check for those um, possible post-op complications. And then as with most patients, we encourage early ambulation to get them moving, hopefully prevent thrombos formation, frequent position changes to help with the skin and also de pre prevent any kind of um, pulmonary issues. And then we don't want them their, their knee to be flexed because now if we have, let's say, a stent placed or a peripheral artery bypass, we don't want to kink that new bypass in the knee passage so because that could obstruct it and then impede the blood flow to the lower extremities and that depends on the surgeon on how long that needs to occur and then certainly compression stockings to help the blood flow and the venous return from the lower extremities and make sure the patient doesn't develop a, a, a blood clot so thank you for watching this video on the peripheral artery disease. Also check out my video on venous thromboembolism or DVT as it is sometimes called, plus all the complications that I've talked about during the video. Thanks for watching Nursing School Explained. See you soon.